By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a cool match for you between a black and green Ponza deck that is taking on a white and blue Stasis deck. So those are two completely different strategies going head to head. And this match was played in the X Points series. So that means we've got Mana Burn and we've got Fallen Empires. Now, if you want to know all the ins and outs about X Points, about the rules, about the community, please check the description below for all the information and links to their Facebook page. Okay, so now we're ready to jump into the deck tech. I'm going to start with the uh, black and green Panza deck that is piloted by Louis. Let's take a look. And here we see the black and green deck of Louis, and I'm just really liking this deck. It's super aggro. I mean, when you look at it, you know what he wants to do. It's, it's very clear, isn't it? I mean, he's playing four sinkhole, four ice storm. So he's going full on the land destruction plan. He can ram them up using his Moxen, using his elves. He's got four Lanawar elves, four elves of deep shadow. So in, in, in a good situation, in a good scenario, he's going to have land destruction starting turn one if he can find the right Mox. If not, he can start doing it turn two if he can find an elf. Um, in turn one, so it's just it's it's pretty aggressive. He's also playing with black vices. Vices go together really well with the land destruction uh, plan because if your opponent has no lands, he probably cannot play any land uh, any any cards out. So he's gonna have a full grip of cards, and then vice can do a lot of work. Now we also see a lot of beef in this deck. We're seeing four urnims. Four Juzams. I mean, this is some serious muscle, and I already know that his opponent is not playing City in a Bottle, so that is really good news for Louis here. And I just think overall, looking at this deck, it is super strong. It definitely wants to win the game early. You know, it's aggro, it's tempo. It, it wants to win the game in those first couple of turns. If the Stasis deck can survive, like up to turn four, then the Stasis deck is probably a favorite of winning. But before that, I mean, Louis is a big favorite of actually winning the match. I think this is a really good deck against Stasis. So uh, this is the deck of Louis. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Eli, who is on blue and white Stasis. And here we see the deck of Eli. So this is a Stasis deck, right? Stasis, of course, classic in old school magic. The enchantment for one blue and one that says, skip the untap step. There's just no untap step. I mean, who would want to do that? Well, stasis players do. Control players want to do that. Because they've just, I mean, they've got twisted minds. Um, but there is hope for us all. Because with stasis, you've got to pay one blue during your upkeep. And if you can no longer pay that upkeep cost, stasis is destroyed. So the thing here is, because you don't have an untap step, it's going to be harder and harder to pay for that one blue mana, right? Well, that's actually where the Howling Mines come in. So the Howling Mines are kind of the engine of this deck, the enabler of the Stasis player. Without Howling Mine, it's impossible to play this strategy, right? Because Howling Mine is going to let you draw more cards. If you draw more cards, you're going to find more islands. If you find more islands, you can keep your Stasis alive, which is, of course, what you want to do because you're a Stasis player. And then the next question is, okay, so you've got your Stasis, you've got your Howling Mine, you're controlling the game. How do you plan to win this? And that's actually a pretty good question because look at Eli's first 60 cards. Look at his list, his main list. There are no vices. Those vices are in the sideboard, not the main board. There are no creatures. There's no Sarah Angel. There's no Zephyr Falcon. There's no Yoshin Soldier. So there's not really a way for Eli to win. So I guess he wants to win by decking his opponent, which is really, really funny. It's also potentially really, really boring to look at. So we'll just have to wait and see how this match is going to unfold. If it's going to be long, a long match, Eli's going to win. If it's going to be a short match, Louis going to win. That's something that I'm sure of. But uh, it's just going to be super interesting to, to watch this matchup. And I personally think that the Black Vice on the side of Louis could be a huge problem for Eli here. Um, now, before we go to this match, there's just something I'd like to point out, and that is the card Brain Geyser. With Brain Geyser, you can draw a lot of cards, but you can also force your opponent to draw a lot of cards cards and that could be uh, a key strategy of Eli because he wants to deck his opponents right so I guess Brain Geyser is kind of a very decisive card could be in this matchup another card that I really like by the way is Kismet it's a card you don't see that often originally from Legends and Enchantment for one white and three that reads all creatures lands and artifacts come into play tapped 
and um, uh, those are the lands and artifacts and creatures of the opponent by the way so not your own lands and artifacts and creatures so i think this enchantment is just really really interesting and a little bit underplayed because it is super annoying to play against it when ev pretty much everything you play all your permanents come into play tapped it's super annoying i personally feel that kismet is a little bit underplayed let me know in the comments below how you feel about Kismet, I would love to hear from you. Um, so we've looked at the deck of Eli, which is kind of strange. We've looked at the deck of Louis, which is kind of aggressive. Now let's take a look at the match. Game number one, here we go. So we've got Louis there on the left side. He's the uh, black and green Ponza player, starting with a forest. And his opponent, Eli, is playing blue and white and is playing stasis. So it's control. And he is starting with a tundra and a pass turn. So Louis hasn't found an elf yet. He's playing with four Llanowars and four elves of Deep Shadow. Here we see him playing a Llanowar elf. So next turn, if he can find a Black Source, he might be able to play a Juzam Jin. But Eli can now, of course, counter after having played his second Blue Source, an Island. Okay, there's that other Black Source. Are we going to see a Juzam? 5-5 five, five Powerhouse. Not yet, it seems. It looks like he's just attacking Eli here. Eli's going to drop to 19. Now remember, Eli wants this game to take long. And Louis wants to finish it as fast as he can, right? He's really the aggro tempo player. He's not doing a great job yet. Hasn't found any land removal. Hasn't found a big, uh, big beef boy to put some pressure on the board. And oh, it looks like Louis dropped a card here. Has found it again. And there's an Elves of Deep Shadow. Okay, that's a little bit more pressure on the board. He can start dealing two every turn. And that could be an issue for Eli, or I guess not, because he's found an ivory tower. That means he's going to gain as much life as he loses with those two points of damage on the table on the side of Louis swinging in here. So Eli going to drop to 16, but he will be back at 18 next turn. There's another Elsa of Deep Shadow. Okay, so there is some pressure here from Louis. It's not too bad, you know. He can deal some damage. But he really needs to find his Juzam or Urnum and maybe start playing some land destruction. Remember, he plays with sinkholes and ice storms and, of course, with crumble. So here we see a crumble on the tower. That's actually a really good move. And I'm kind of expecting a counterspell here by Eli. No, there's no counterspell. And now Eli is in a little bit of trouble, though, because, I mean, that's three damage on the board. That's not great playing a City of Brass here. And what is he? Oh, okay, he's playing a recall. So using the recall to get the tower back, which is not ideal because with recall, you know, it's card disadvantage. He's losing two cards to take one card back and he's playing it out as well. And of course, with ivory tower, you want to keep the cards in hand to gain life. So Eli is in a little bit of trouble here. I mean, if, if Louis can play another creature. Okay, Ice Storm, not too bad. Taking care of a Tundra. Attacking for three. Oh no, not attacking. He's actually casting an Urnum Jin instead. That is much, much better. That Urnum Jin is going to be a problem here. Seven points of damage waiting for Eli next turn. And that Ivory Tower is doing absolutely nothing for him. He's on 16. Is he going to drop to nine next turn? At least he needs one Swords for the Urnum, I feel, to kind of stay in this. Or this could be a very, very short game one. Tapping two. Okay, there's a balance. That will do it. That's like a one-sided Wrath of God. That is a really good job. But of course, it does mean that Eli has to discard a lot of cards. Three cards here go to the bin for Eli. And he's losing a land as well. So he's got a hefty price to pay. But it was absolutely necessary for Eli. And uh, things are kind of looking up for him. Remember, the longer the game takes it, the better it should be for Eli as he is the control player. There we see a sinkhole. And this is getting a little bit problematic for Eli here. Okay, this Howling Mine is very, very important. Remember, this is the engine of Eli's deck. Let's see if Louis can do anything about it, if he wants to do anything about it. So he's going to tap three. There's an Ice Storm on the Tundra. And yes, he is playing the Crumble. I think that's a very good decision, Louis. I mean, in any control deck with a Howling Mine, the Mines are, are, are the thing to really deal with the... Um, as soon as possible, that's what I'm trying to say here. And there's a Juzam Jin counterspell by Eli. Taking care of that Juzam. That's very important for Eli here. And Louis now finding the Vice. And this is actually not important right now. But the Black Vice and the Ivory Tower, they cross each other out. And this, is, I feel, is a problem for Eli. Because he really relies on the life gain of Ivory Tower. 
And there we see an attack by the Elves of Deep Shadow here on Eli, gonna drop to 16. Eli's got five cards in hand. Remember, he's not gaining any life because of the advice on the side of uh, Louis. And he's got a Pendlehaven there. Okay, there's a Swords. So Louis's gonna gain two. He's gonna go up to 19, I believe. And Eli not finding anything yet, just passing turn. Louis passing turn here. Both players in top decking mode. And I think for Eli, he's just very unhappy with only having three cards. Okay, here we see a Chaos Orb. That can destroy another land on the side of Eli, but there is a Counterspell. I mean, that Counterspell was very important because Eli needs a lot of lands. Remember, he is the Stasis player. Passing turn here. There we see an Urnum. Urnum Jin. Will there be a Counterspell from Eli? There's not going to be a Counterspell. This is a big problem for Eli. That's four damage a turn. So in four turns, he could be out of the... Game one here, losing game one. There's the attack. Eli dropping to 12. Just drawing a card passing turn here. Eli needs to find a solution. He's gonna drop to eight. Seven cards in hand for Eli. Playing a boomerang on the end step. Okay, so that's gonna give him an extra turn. Does he also have a counter spell in hand to perhaps counter the earn him when uh, Louis is going to cast it again? Louis got a full grip of cards as well. Is he gonna? Yeah, he's just gonna recast the Urnum. Keeping his Pendlehaven and Bayou open. And pass turn. No counter spell from Eli. And there is a stasis. Okay, so the stasis kind of helps, especially in combination with the uh, Time Vault. Remember, you can untap Time Vault by giving a turn to your opponent, which is fine with stasis. Ooh, there we see a Berserk. There is a Boomerang, though. So that is really good news. So now Louis is kind of in trouble here, but also Eli is in trouble because he doesn't have any islands anymore to pay for the stasis cost. So there goes the stasis here by Eli. He's gonna lose it, he cannot untap. Remember, it's untap, upkeep, and then draw. And you have to pay during your upkeep for stasis. I guess now they're kind of talking about what to do, what not to do. Does Eli want to do anything with the Time Vault? That's the question. I think he wants to go back and he's saying, you know what, I can give you an extra turn with my Time Vault. And then I can keep my stasis alive. So they're going to just rewind a little bit. And I think this is a very good decision by Eli. And of course, nice by Louis. They're just saying, okay, you know what, you do it. It's fine. And, um, you know, these are always friendly matches played in good spirits. So Eli taking the extra turn now. And that's so important because that means that Eli does get that untapped step, allowing him, of course, to counter, for example, which is, which is key for Eli here. So Eli's on four, remember that. I mean, it's not looking very good for him. Can he kind of get control of the game? That's a question. There is a disenchant. Okay, this is a good start for Eli because... That means he can now start like gaining life again with that ivory tower. I feel that's really important here. Oh man, a new vice. <laughs> Perfect answer by Louis and an Urnum. Oh man, this is not good. I kind of feel for Eli. Finally, he got rid of that vice and he could start tanking some life again with the tower. Immediate response by Louis playing another vice. Okay, there's his stasis. That is, but it's not enough though. He's on four. He can attack him now and kill him, right? Oh, we get a Swords. I mean, Eli is really good at, at, at kind of staying alive. And remember, Eli still has that Time Vault. So he can now untap the Time Vault. Exactly. Give an extra turn to Louis. Louis played another Vice, by the way. So Louis's going to pass turn here. And yeah, of course, he can pay one more time for Stasis. He can pass. With the double vice, it does mean he's going to take one damage because he's got one tower. So he's going to drop to three, exactly. Now he can draw, he can play out a land, hopefully. No lands, it seems. He's going to take a turn, but he's got six in hand. So he's going to take two damage. He's on one. What a crazy first game this is. Going to find an island. Cast a disenchant. Okay. That's going to keep him alive. And pass turn to Louis here. 
Oh, wow. What a match this is. Louis playing a single on the Tundra. I mean, the land removal is really an issue for Eli. I mean, he cannot really keep his stasis alive. I mean, even though he's finding a lot of land. There we see um, another elf. So that's a 1-1. That's a way to deal damage. Remember, he's on 1. Is he going to win it with the Lana Elves? Going to attack here. There's a boomerang. Eli is really good at staying alive. I mean, I have to give him credit for that. There's another Lana War Elves. And there's a Juzam Jin. So two really, really big creatures here. Eli needs a little miracle. At least he can draw two cards. Already played out of balance. Okay, this is one. It can take out one threat. So this is probably going to be a flip on the Juzam. So he's going to use his mind as the target. And he's going to flip on the Juzam. So the Juzam Jin is gone. Past turn. I mean, he's still going to die though. Or does he have a sword? He already played, I think, at least two swords to plowshares. Another boomerang. Boomerang number three, I believe. Casting two more threats on the side of Louis. And a sinkhole. No more white mana for Eli here. This has got to be the end of the road, right? Does Eli have another trick up his sleeve? Nope. This is the end of the road. At least the end for game one. We're going to let these players shuffle up and then we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's Eli now on the play, starting with an island passing turn here. So, I mean, Eli was very good at staying alive. I just feel like this is just a bad matchup for him here. Louis starts with a vice. This is really not what you want to see if you're Eli. Also playing a Mox there to cast an Elves of the Deep Shadow, Mox Emerald. And a pass, so some damage here for Eli from the vice. I believe um, he's going to drop, yeah, to 18 or 6 cards in hand. I'm going to draw card number 7. I mean, it's not the biggest problem, but the thing here is that, you know, Louis can also attack with the Elves of Deep Shadow, put some extra pressure on. Yeah. So Howling Mine is good because, you know, that's what Eli needs to do. He wants to find an Ivory Tower to kind of counter the, the vice on the side of Louis. But for Louis, this is also good, you know. He's going to draw into... More threats. I mean, if he can just find some land removal or an Urnum, for example. No black sources on the side of Louis, by the way. So that's not ideal for him. Of course, he can cast, he can tap the Elves of Deep Shadow for one black. But his deck really needs a double black. There's an Ice Storm. So this is perfect for him now because he can also attack. So taking care of a land. And, okay, he's casting another Elves of Deep Shadow. Can he do that? No, because Elves of Deep Shadow only get, gives black mana, but maybe maybe Eli allows him to tap the lands a little bit different. Remember, these players are pretty lenient towards each other, which is nice. So he's still using that green here to cast the Lanor Elves and passing turn here. So, I mean, Eli, again, of course, taking damage, one point of damage from the Vice of Louis. Drawing two extra cards, he really needs to start finding answers again. And, and here you can see the problem for Eli, right? He's under pressure from turn one. And he just needs a little bit more time to kind of get a grip of the game. And it looks like there's just too much pressure from Louis to actually get to that point. There's a Bayou played by Louis here. Going to tap double black. Are we going to see a sinkhole? I mean, these land destruction spells are just really, really problematic. Okay, there we're going to see a counter spell probably. Ooh, no, a disenchant. So disenchant on the vice. That's good. That's something. He's probably going to lose a uh, city of brass. Looks like he hasn't put away a land here. Exactly. Now the land's gone. He's going to tap three. Oh, there's a nice storm. This is so bad for Eli. I mean, Louis's land destruction plan is going off in full cylinders. And he's passing turn here to Eli. He's going to draw two cards. Hopefully he can find some lands. But there's already three damage on the board now for him. Okay, the Ivory Tower is actually pretty good. But is he going to get time to really tank life? Two more cards here for Louis. If he can find more land destruction, it's almost over for Eli already. Even though we've just started. So he's probably going to swing in here for three. 
Then Eli's going to go to 13. Next turn, he's going to gain one life. He's going to go up to 14. And is he going to cast a Juzam here? Two black and two. There's the Juzam Jin. 5-5. Five, five. Problem for Eli. He's going to gain one measly life. He needs to find a balance again and a white source. I mean, Louis is really committing to the board, but why not? I mean, he just needs, needs to finish Eli as fast as he can. He's got six cards in hand past his turn here. Louis taking a damage from his own Juzam, dropping to 17. He can attack now for eight. That means Eli is going to be set back on six. Are we going to see a Swords? There's a Swords to Plowshares on the Juzam, probably. He is going to take a damage from his own City of Brasdale, and of course, three damage from the Elves. So he's going to drop all the way to 10, if I'm correct. Exactly, he's on 10 now. There's a pass by Louis. I mean, Eli is again in trouble. And he's now going to go to 11. He's going to gain some life from the Ivory Tower. Going to draw two cards. Can he find an answer here? Still needs that balance. Okay, there's a Black Lotus. Cracking the Lotus. What is he going to play? And there we see a Kiss Mat. Okay, I mean, that's not really going to do it for him, is it? I wonder if I wonder why he's playing out this this kismet to be honest. Perhaps he's got an a stasis in hand and he feels like okay, if I've got the kismet then at least the big creatures of my opponent will come in tapped and then in response I can cast my stasis and keep them tapped and and by doing that also keeping myself alive that could be part of his strategy. But remember, the more cards he plays out, the less life he actually gains from his Ivory Tower. Here we see an attack for three again on the life total of Eli. So he's going to drop to eight. And there's a crumble on the tower. Perhaps I would have crumbled the Howling Mine, actually. There's a sinkhole. I mean, Louis is really in the driver's seat again. And it just seems to be quite one-sided here. Eli is going to drop to nine, it seems. Going to draw two cards at least from the mine. Needs to find an answer here. I guess he's on eight for some reason. It's always hard to kind of follow these conversations. He's back on nine again. <laughs> As long as they both agree, it's fine. Going for his cards, he's going to untap. He's going to draw two cards from the Howling Mine. And it just seems to be a very, very bad matchup for Eli here facing Louis. I mean, land destruction against Stasis is just horrible. Vice against Stasis is just really bad. There we see a second blue for Eli here. Playing out another Howling Mine. Now, usually Howling Mines are good. Remember, it's the engine of his deck. But the problem here is he's, he's just so low on lands. And he can only play out one land a turn. It would be so nice for Eli if, if Fast Bond would be white or green. And he's going to draw a couple of cards here. I mean, Louis is also drawing three cards. It's a pretty big chance there's a Juzem in there or an Urnum in there. He's going to use the Pendlehaven, so that means he can swing for four. It's exactly what he does. Eli is going to drop here to, to six or to five, I think, because he was on nine, right? There we see an Ice Storm making matters even worse here for Eli. And I believe there's a pass turn now. So Eli can at least draw three cards because of the double Howling Mine. 
And I think if you're Louis, you really want to end this game as fast as you can, because it's just risky with all those Howling Mines in play. There's an untap again. It looks like he's changing his mind. Does he want to, for example, play out a stasis that will give him one extra turn? The problem is, of course, he cannot pay the cost for stasis. There's another Howling Mine. That I can actually understand. I mean, if you're Eli, you're like, okay, Louis's already drawing tons of cards, and, you know, my deck just needs a lot of card draw. The biggest problem for Eli here, strangely enough, is the lands. And he's still so light on lands because Louis has just so much land destruction. I mean, look at that grip of cards in Louis's hand. It's just amazing. And of course, the strip mine comes into play tap because of that Kismet. There's the attack of three, dealing four more points of damage. He's going to drop to two. I do feel like he should have been on one, but I don't think it's very relevant for this game, by the way. There's a sinkhole on the island. I mean, Louis is finding all his land destruction, but that's not a big surprise because he's getting so, so many cards from the Howling Mines of Eli. But also I under, understand Eli because he needs the Howling Mines to you know play the game he wants to play. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 for Eli here. Whatever he does, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn out wrong for him. And I think there's really nothing he can do. The only thing is maybe a planes and a balance. There we see an island that is not a planes. And he's showing his hand. I mean, yeah, I think this is it. That was a very one-sided game number two and really showing how good Louis' deck is in this particular matchup. Thank you to Eli and Louis for showing this very interesting game. And uh, I would love to hear from you, Eli, to let us know in the comments below how your deck did um, in this tournament. This was, uh, I believe this match was recorded way, way, way in the past, a couple of months ago. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's even still in your, in your active memory, Eli, but it would be cool if you could let us know how your deck did. Okay, so that was the match. Thank you for watching another one right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to like this video, leave a comment and share it on your socials. And then if you're new to the channel, welcome. Great that you've found Timmy Talks. Please consider subscribing and ring that bell. And then there is one last thing that you can consider doing for the channel and that is becoming a patron. We've got a pretty active community on Patreon and uh, it's quite easy to visit the page and become a patron. It already starts with $1 a month. There's probably an info card popping up right now. If you click on that info card, that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page and you can read all about our Patreon program. What I can already tell you is that it is pretty insane because you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can join all the Timmy Talks events. And if you want to play a match with me, that is also possible starting with tier number two and tier number three. Um, and of course, starting with already that first tier, your name will be in the end scroll of every single video, including this one. So what are we waiting for? Let's go to the end scroll and take a look at our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Somebody can see.